Many of us depend on cell phones every day. Our use of them is having a dramatic impact on our culture and our planet. How are cell phones intertwined with a globalized world? Scientists are studying how these devices are altering our lives and the lives of millions of other people who interact with them. Join us now for a conversation with anthropologist Joshua A. Bell to explore our unseen connections to cell phones. Now, here's your host, Maggie Benson. Okay, what should we hashtag this? Anthropology rock. <laughs> Good one. Science how? Yeah. Oh, we're live. Oops. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. We're live here at Curious with another episode of Smithsonian Science How. So happy to have you here to learn about cell phone science. We're joined by cultural anthropologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Joshua Bell. Thanks for being here, Josh. Thanks for having me. So Josh, can we kick off our show today with, by having you tell us what a cultural anthropologist is? Yeah, of course. So uh, cultural anthropology is one branch of anthropology, and, and anthropology as a discipline is basically the study of humans in all our diversity, past, present. Um, and cultural anthropology really focuses on humans more or less of now and you know the recent past. And we look at this thing called culture, which is one way of talking about the belief systems, um, the actual objects that we make and use, and the social structure that kind of binds us together and helps us to kind of form consciously and unconsciously our identity, both in the present and over time, and it is replicated through families, through work, um, through the nation, et cetera. That's really interesting, but you work here at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum where we have millions of fossils and minerals and plants and animals. How does cultural, food, cultural anthropology fit in? That's a great question, again. Um, so a lot of people forget that humans are actually part of the natural world, right? So we're part of the animal kingdom, as it were. And so anthropology as a discipline emerged out of that natural history. And here in the museum, anthropology is really the kind of hinge discipline. We look at kind of how humans are impacting the environment, but also how in our diversity we inhabit the world and make what it is today. So in the museum, we have over 2 million objects from around the world that have been collected over 200 years of the Smithsonian's history. And that helps us to kind of ex explore cultural diversity in the present, in the past, and think about what it is that we are doing on this planet with each other and to the planet. As you mentioned, humans are part of this natural history story. So as a human yourself, how can you be an unbiased observer of other cultures and people? So that's a kind of a perennial problem for anthropology. And we kind of acknowledge first and foremost that we are biased. And the way in which we kind of seek to kind of unlearn our biases in the field is by going typically long term and living with the community. So I've done since 2000 worked in Papua New Guinea, which is a nation the size roughly of California that is located above Australia. And I've lurked uh, worked and lived with people there for my dissertation two years and have been going back subsequently, had, had people come here and do interviews, participant observations. So I've learned how to make canoes, how to paddle in a canoe, help to build a house, that sort of thing. And then sat with people, interviewed them, watched what's happened in the community, do, done surveys and a whole variety of tasks to kind of unpack what it is that make these people think the way they do and act the way they do. So are you now applying your skills as a cultural anthropologist to cell phones in the same way that you studied the people of Papua New Guinea? Yeah, so cell phones really kind of raise another question of like, what is technology doing to us? So again, um, it's by actually engaging with people and looking at how they actually use cell phones um, that we can kind of think through some of these issues about what cell phones are really doing to us. Are they kind of transforming us, making us better humans, more efficient, or is it kind of leading to some dystopian future where we're no longer interacting with each other? So cell phones become a way to kind of look at that intimacy that emerges through cell phone use, but also then the global ways in which cell phones are part of this uh, larger supply chain. So our, what's materialized in our cell phone? Yeah, so a whole lot of values, systems, beliefs. Um, and I mean, first and foremost, it would be the kind of various things that are inside the cell phone. So the actual materials that are inside your cell phone. Yeah. Actually, that's a really good question because I use my phone every single day and I don't know what makes it run. 
Yeah. I wonder how many people actually do. <laughs> well, until I started doing this project, I didn't either. So that's a great question. Let's ask our viewers right now. What right. do you think? Let's do it. Now's an opportunity for you to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us what you think. Do you know what's inside your phone? Yes or no? You can respond using the window that appears to the right of your video screen. And remember that this is the same place that you can post questions for Dr. Bell to answer during today's live program. So Josh, we can both see the results coming in, and it looks like it's 50-50, but a small majority, 53% of our viewers say no. They do not know what's inside the cell phone. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think when one thinks about the array of stuff that's actually in the cell phone, it's actually quite astounding. And it's not, um, let's say, unusual given the other highly manufactured things we have, such as cars and computers. But the cell phone brings together a kind of interesting set um, that is of, of things that are unique to electronics. So if we look at this cell phone here, um, we have most obviously things such as um, gold plating, we have copper, um, we have these chips which are made of various materials, rare earths and others, um, camera, the glass of which is a sapphire glass, so artificial sapphires. So you have a range of things that go in that come from various distinct locales, which actually make the electronics work um, and connect this cell phone in various ways to different locations around the world. So minerals from around the world um, are mined and then materialized inside this cell phone. Yeah, so it brings together a whole set of relationships, not only the kind of places that we see on this map here, so bauxite, which then becomes aluminum, which is found in Australia, elsewhere, tin from Indonesia, then we look at the US, there's gold, beryllium, iron, etc. All of these places are sources for minerals which are found on the cell phone, and then sites of labor as well to extract it and refine it. So to be able to get to the point of mining, like we see in this image here, to me owning and using a cell phone, there must be a lot of steps in between. I mean, we see here uh, the picture of a- Casserite. <laughs> right, and which must actually be used to mine right. an element that's needed for right. a phone. And so you're just seeing also some pictures previously of tantalium, which is another uh, earth rare uh, material that's found in, in cell phones. Yeah, so the supply chain, this is a term that anthropologists use to think about, it's from economics, but to think about all the things that, that supply literally the manufacturer to, to construct the device. And so um, you can see in this uh, image here, we have of course the mining, so we have a range of mining from industrial, we showed you images of that, then more artisanal individuals actually making mining materials, and it all has to be refined in some way, whether that be factory or smaller scale, then there's a whole subset and series of manufacturers, from fall, small manufacturers of specific components, to then the larger companies that actually put the things together, um, to then getting into the store, not to mention the designers who help to cook up the various ideas, the engineers, and then you as a consumer. So there is a huge global effort in getting these cell phones to an operational state. Yes, I much so. can understand why they're so expensive when my contract isn't up. Right, they are expensive, yeah. Uh, so Josh, we have a couple of student questions. You okay. wanna take one? Let's do it. All right, this one comes from Ananda. What is the extent of the environmental damage from making cell phones? Mm, that's a great question. So um, it's, the extent of the environmental damage is difficult to quantify. Um, and mining, of course, depending on how it's done, um, it's hard to kind of, quote unquote, be totally clean mining, right? Mining has its impacts. So the issue, of course, is more ethical mining such that you actually take care of tailings and stuff from mines and dispose of it, store it in responsible ways. Um, so it really depends. Uh, but 
that this is to say really that there's really no industrial process on the planet that doesn't have some ecological impact. So the impact of cell phones in relationship to other things might be smaller or less, but it really depends on the processes. Great, this question comes from Julie and Kenzie. What would happen to us if phones were never invented? Would we still be using pigeons or do you think we would have found an easier way? <laughs> it would actually make life a lot interesting if we use pigeons or birds and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, no, I think that's a great question because it does raise, you know, how our cell phones actually have they changed us. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later in the, in the, in the cast. But I think um, certainly it would change the, the quickness of how we talk. Um, to each other and how we are informed about events in the world. So it, it certainly would. How much it would change us is, is a debate. I'd be interested to see all those pigeons flying around. Yeah, it would be very confusing, <laughs> I imagine. So this next question comes in by video. Let's take okay. a look. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and I was wondering how people figured out what materials would work to make cell phones. That's another good question. So, and, and it comes down to basic engineering, right? So um, a l from the onset of mining and kind of just industrial manufacturer, humans being creative as we are, have worked to kind of figure out what do these elements do, right? So pretty early on, it was discovered that copper is a great conductor, for example, and it's pretty, it does corrode, but gold, for example, doesn't. So through trial and error, um, through industrial processes, people have discovered what actually works. And, and this is where it's exciting because we're constantly innovating and finding new minerals and materials. Awesome. Thanks for all of the really wonderful questions. And thank you, Josh, for helping us understand how the cell phone is really a fabulous object for you to study as a cultural anthropologist because it really is connecting us in lots of ways globally. Mm. So we kind of went there a little bit with some of these student questions right. about what happens when um, some of these cell phones are actually being discarded. Mm. And it raises a good question about repair and how often repairs actually happen. But I think we should ask our viewers what they think about repairing your own cell phone first. Sounds great. Viewers, here's a chance for you to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us, would you ever have a cell phone repaired? Yes or no? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right. So Josh, 69% of our viewers say that they would have a cell phone repaired. That's great, actually. I'm really pleased to hear it. And it shows that actually what used to be something that happened on a smaller scale is slowly picking up. And that raises the fact that people are aware of, one, how valuable and important these things are, and that the possibility is there to actually repair them. Absolutely. I mean, I hear a little bit about the e-waste that is generated by throwing away electronics. Is this a problem with cell phones, too? It is a problem, and I actually brought some here to show people. So in the Smithsonian, <laughs> Those aren't all yours, are no, they? this is from uh, <laughs> colleagues here at the Smithsonian, where we have a recycling effort underway, and most you know companies do this. Um, but this is a growing problem. Like, what do you do um, if every six months new cell phones come out? and people want them, you know, how do we deal with the, the, the e-waste? I mean, in 2010, uh, it's reported that there were 152 million cell phones discarded. Wow, wow. that's so a that's huge number. So that's half of the US population right there. So, um, so the issue becomes what to do with them. And because of all the rare materials, minerals, important, valuable things that are inside these electronics, the question is, you know, what do we do with them? And so more and more, industry is developing actually to extract them, so to do large-scale um, recycling. Um, but there are small-scale people who are actually using their own tools and wits to extract the gold, which they then sell. Um, and then unfortunately, when people throw them out or they don't get separated out from the waste stream, 
Um, they can end up in landfills, which is not great. Uh, but then also what happens is e-waste is also um, exported. Um, and this is slowly changing as environmental laws, global and local, um, kind of shift. But a lot of uh, e-waste still goes to countries such as Ghana, China, where um, people need the cash and they're willing to take the kind of health and environmental risks to extract this stuff out of the phones. So we just saw a modified supply chain there. If we're right. repairing and extracting some of the materials out of these cell phones, does that mean that we don't have to go necessarily back to the source of that mineral to extract it from the mine? Yeah, so definitely. So what happens, of course, once you start doing industrial recycling um, is that can go back in. Now, the issue, of course, is that you can't fully get everything out. Um, and of course, so what, what has to happen is industry has to get better at recycling. But the manufacturing is such that in certain cases, it's really hard to get some of the stuff out once it's in. Now, why not get your cell phone repaired instead of recycling it or uh, throwing it in the trash? I mean, is there a natural aversion to repair? Or is it just something that's not available? Yeah, so I mean, so we've been doing some research for about a year. Um, colleagues at George Washington University and I, and what we found was that repair, of course, for a lot of people, raises the issue of how intimate we are with these things. We use them for banking, we use them for email, personal work related, we use them for pictures, we use them for all sorts of things. Um, and so the issue becomes, like, do you really want to open that? If it's a part of you, and a very personal part of you, do you feel comfortable giving someone this device to you know, that you have to give your password code to access, et cetera. So certainly when I've done it, and I've had my cell phone now repaired three times, um, yeah, the first time I was a little nervous. And like, what are you going to do with it? How, you know? It takes and a lot of trust to give that to does. somebody. Right. Absolutely. Right. And then the other issue is that people don't really know about repair, right? So that's something that, that but I think once people get over their kind of hesitancy, and realize that actually these things can be repaired and this becomes part of a larger knowledge, people will. Josh, you mentioned that you have this intimate relationship with your phone where you really feel kind of connected to it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that even when my phone is misplaced, I feel a little bit lost. I don't know if somebody else has it. Right. I'm looking for um, get in to get in touch with other people. I might right. be lost without my Maps app. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know what to do. You've studied a little bit of that, haven't you? Yeah, so um, with Joel Kuypers and Alex Den at George Washington University, we've, we, we've started a study looking at, um, well, we did a study last year looking at high school students and, and teenagers and how they use their phones. And, and what we found, of course, was that actually teenagers are one of the highest users um, and that it is deeply a part of their identity. It's how they're forming social networks, so friends, making connections, taking photos. Um, and so it's one of these things that actually when they lose it, um, such as the statement you're seeing on the screen from one of our um, interlocutors or informants, they're, they're quite distressed, right? So this is a technology that they have a hard time putting down. So I wonder how our viewers watching today feel when they misplace their own phone. I'd be interested to know. Let's ask them. Viewers, here's another opportunity for you to participate in a live poll with us. How do you feel when your phone is misplaced? Do you feel entirely lost, somewhat disoriented, no impact or relief to be off of it? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right of your video screen. So Josh, we're seeing a wide range of reactions. Um, luckily, only 13% of <laughs> our viewers are entirely lost without their cell phones, but 40% feel somewhat disoriented. Yeah, I'm not surprised, actually. I mean, I think as this technology, as we do more and more, and as things are collapsed, 
other technologies, your clock, you mentioned the map function, um, these things have become indispensable, right? I know when I get in a car, I always am like, where's my phone? You know, how am I going to get to where I need to go? So it, I'm not surprised. So how are cell phones impacting culture? Um, you mentioned DC culture um, among teens, but what about teens nationwide or even globally? Yeah, so um, this is, I think, an uh, interesting question because I think a lot of people think that technology, there's a universal understanding of technology. Something like the cell phone comes out and we all adopt it and realize and understand. But what we as cultural anthropologists like to argue and push, and, and I firmly in this camp, is actually no, it affects people differently. And this is where culture comes in and plays a distinct role in how people understand this operating. So the answer to your question, the very short answer to a very long question really, um, or potentially long answer, is it varies, right? So around the world, I think people are finding that this is something that they have to work through. So there are a lot of, I think what is universal is there are a lot of what we call moral panics or people kind of like, what is this doing to us? Is this creating new tensions between gen gen generations? We find the cell phone has within the 40 years that it's been around has probably, it's the single fastest technology that's been adopted globally. So new languages emerging, texting language is a primary example that we find here. <laughs> LOL. Apps, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> apps are changing how people interact, people's notions of privacy. Um, we find, you know, mobile money in places that don't have ready, easy access to um, banking, such as parts of Africa and the Caribbean. So this is transforming how people interact. There are now new apps that allow doctors to actually diagnose things through the smartphone camera, et cetera. So what we find is it's, it's making up for infrastructures, but at the same time, you know, it's amplifying already existing cultural trends that, that we find in different societies, i.e. the need to communicate, the importance of kinship, while at the same time challenging kinship in different ways. So it's varied. It, clearly, the, the verdict's not out how it's transforming it. I would argue it is. It's a question of is it a hard transformation or complete, or is it more of a weak one? So you're a scientist, you're a cultural anthropologist. You have the tools to be able to study how uh, our cultures are being impacted by the cell phone. What's in the future for your research? Yeah, so with colleagues um, that I mentioned before at George Washington University, we're going to be looking, shifting, building on the work that we've done with teenagers to date, the little survey we've done, and to look at families. And so basically for three years, uh, we're going to track the impact of technology with teenagers, both in terms of their school, what they can and, do, can and cannot do at school, but also home. How is it impacting how they interact with their parents? What are the intergenerational tr tensions? And so hopefully th so through doing the ethnography, actually show people what's actually happening on the ground. Who are they talking to? How is this affecting their perceptions of themselves, um, their language use? And how do these things, you know, when they don't work, how does it, you know, affect them? You know, is it is it a source of panic when they lose it, etc.? So I saw that image uh, on the screen there of the mm. family sitting around the dinner table all on their own phones, right. and you hear that texting is ruining families today. Right. I mean, is that something you're going to be looking at? We will. And the thing, what you don't know, of course, with images like this that you see, like such as that uh, image and then in the, in the press is actually, who are these people talking to, right? They might all be talking to each other and they may be playing some games. So they may be connecting in a different way. That's not face to face. They may be connecting with their you know, relatives who are in a different location. So I think the issue is, again, unpacking what's going on. How is this impacting people's notions of each other, et cetera? So what's in store for the futures of cell phone? I mean, of the cell phone. I mean, I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, so I think cell phone technology is just going to keep rapidly changing and changing. And we're already seeing some of the new trends with Google Glass and the new wearable wristwatches, Fitbits, et cetera, like that. Um, so I think we're going to see more of that. Um, Google has come out with a prototype that they're going to, I don't know, launch when, but which will basically uh, embed um, fabric, so we'll have smart fabrics, which will allow us to connect to smartphones that way. That might be dangerous for me. I'm known to spill on myself. Right, exactly. That's <laughs> a more chance for repair. Yes. Um, and then, you know, I think going, looking 30, 40, 50 years out, um, you know, this is where science fiction, I think, is actually useful. And this is where, you know, implants could be a possibility such that you actually have something 
connected to your head. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll look back at this webcast and say that Dr. Bell, he really knew where cell phones were headed. Or I was completely wrong, which would be <laughs> interesting and fine. Time will tell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Josh, do you have any recommendations to um, myself, to our viewers today, about what to do when your cell phone does break? What if the screen cracks? What if it doesn't charge anymore? I mean, should I upgrade if I'm up for an mm. upgrade or should I throw it away? What should I do? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's an individual choice. I, I would think that uh, what one needs to do, as with all the things we consume, you have to think about, you know, kind of, do you need that new thing? So, you know, if it's a matter of, oh, I can get this screen fixed, and actually the phone is totally operable, I would push people to think about repair. Um, if one needs to get the latest device because of whatever, then, then you need to do that. And then there's a question of kind of how you ethically can dispose of your phone. So is it recycling? Is it a secondary market, et cetera? So people just need to be really aware and conscious that their choices, technological and otherwise, actually have an impact that you may not see in your immediate neighborhood, but is a global thing. So Josh, I'd be really interested after learning all of this wonderful stuff about cell phones to see if our audience has any different opinion about repairing their cell phone. That'd be great. Let's do it. All right. Audience, we're asking you again, would you ever have a cell phone repaired? Yes or no? Knowing what you know now, we want to see if your attitude has changed. So Josh, 69% of our viewers would repair their cell phones, but you know what? That's probably better than the current rate of people who are having their cell phone repaired today. Yeah, I mean, I think what's going to happen is people, as it becomes easier, and this is actually where manufacturing and industry needs to make cell phones more repairable, um, but people also just need to be more aware of it as a possibility. So that's great to see that more people are thinking about it after our thing. Josh, thank you so much for being here today and helping us understand uh, more about the cell phone and how it really connects us globally to people around the world. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. And I think this is, again, I think one of the wonders of cultural anthropology, one that you can actually study anything. Um, cell phones, et cetera. But it really, how it, I, I hope that this project, if it does nothing else, is to get people to realize how we are connected globally in various seen and unseen ways. Great. So a very astute observation from R. Murari. Are you related to Alexander Bell? <laughs> or is it just a coincidence that you've shared the last yeah, same last it name? is. It is just a coincidence, but it makes working on cell phones and uh, interesting. So that's a great <laughs> question. We are unfortunately all out of time. Thank you so much for sharing all of this wonderful information about cell phone use and how our cultures are changing because of them. Thank you for having me. Can you tell our viewers where they can learn a little bit more about this kind of work? Right. So at the bottom of your screen, you're going to find a um, link to the Curious page, which has a list of resources um, about cell phones, about the minerals that go in cell phones. Besides that, um, if you're interested in repair, I would recommend ifixit.org. We're also developing a website as part of our own project, Ongoing Work, which we're going to make available to viewers as soon as it's done, hopefully in July. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of you for all of your awesome questions and for joining us for another episode of Smithsonian Science How. If you miss this broadcast, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu. Thanks for watching. You can explore more Smithsonian Science How shows and teaching resources on our website curious.si.edu.